Hi guys, I've got a load of Harry Potter themed Christmas DIYs for you today to get us all feeling a bit merry this time of year. Some are random ideas that I've had, some are inspired by other projects that I've seen crafters take on. I've tried to not use too many different materials or anything expensive so that if you fancy giving any of these a go, or hopefully all these DIYs a go, it won't be too hard to grab all of the stuff that you need. For today's project I was inspired by some other DIYs that I've seen where people People have used miniature Ford Angliers and then floated them above forests to create the scene from Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. I've changed it up a bit though and have swapped the much more sensible and easier acquiring of a model car to create the scene on a much tinier level so that it can fit inside one of these clear baubles. Such a nice and easily accessible project to begin with. <laughs> now I'll be honest, this idea was much easier to do in my head than it turned out to be in reality, so straight off the bat, if you don't feel confident cutting the templates that I've created out of balsa wood, and to be honest this whole first part of the video, you can always print out your own photo of the Ford Anglia from the film instead, just make sure that it's at a small enough scale to fit inside your bauble. I've just got a thing for using materials other than paper when I can, but if you print it you can always make it double sided, so it really does make sense as an alternative. <laughs> but if you're a sucker for punishment like me, I'll show you how to make it from wood. I created these tiny templates by using a photo of a Ford Anglia from the internet and condensing it down to a few layers on Photoshop so that it would be somewhat 3D when I cut them all out. I scaled them down to float inside my bauble. I think they were probably a little less than 2cm length total, so it did get pretty fiddly as you can imagine, or well, you will see. So once I had the templates cut out with a craft knife, I used them as a guide and outlined them onto the balsa wood, and then I got to cutting them out again. I thought I was being really clever cutting them out at an angle, because then some of the straight lines would go with the grain of the wood, but with these being so tiny, it was impossible for them not to fracture right down those grooves that I was using. Well, it was impossible for me anyway. So I had to use some craft glue to put them all back together again at the end. In some ways though, this may have been a good thing, as it might have made them a bit stronger. This is what I'm telling myself anyway. And when it came to the windows, I tried to cut those tiniest gaps out first before cutting the outline, just because the wood was a lot stronger as a whole rather than in its tiny car form that I made in the end. I still had to glue them at the end, but it was a lot less difficult as the pieces were larger overall at that point, and when you're cutting from a larger piece of wood, you just have a lot more grip and it's a lot easier to cut. After I had my pieces all cut out and I'd axed that top fiddly layer of my design, because after four tries at that one I just started running out of wood, <laughs> I glued them together with some craft glue and then I used the edge of my knife to turn some of the little wheels and detail bits all into the right positions. I need to get some new scalpels so I was stuck using these cheap craft knives that I had for this DIY, which definitely did make things a lot harder, so if you are going to give this one a go I would definitely recommend spending a quid on a scalpel knife Life, rather than being so needlessly cheap like I was and making life a lot harder for yourself. Once it did dry, I sanded down the mini car. It's a lot easier to do this once it's all dry and finished than each part individually, unless you want to sand down your fingernails at the same time. Guess that could be a time saver too, I guess. <laughs> After sanding, I lay down a layer of dark grey blue paint all over the wood. My thinking was, layer from the bottom to the top of the image, so this would be the back dark windows of the car. Also using a dark colour as a base is a nice way to hide any blemishes and such, so it did work in my favour too. And once that layer was dry, I blended some of the iconic light blue paint and painted the next raised level, the chassis, all blue. This is a big bonus of doing the layers of wood earlier, probably the one and only bonus, <laughs> because painting is a lot more forgiving when it's on multiple layers like this than if I'd been painting all on one level at such a small scale. I would probably still make sure you go eat something though before you paint this, because you don't want shaky hands after doing all of this work. Again, I let that all dry and then added the little details with a thin brush, and then I glossed it with some sealer just to protect the paint. I know it's going to be safe in the clear bauble, but I wanted to make sure that it was sealed. 
If you don't have some sealant, then a thin layer of PVA glue will work just as well. The only difference is maybe in five years it might yellow a bit, but a lot of that depends on the brand of PVA that you've used. Then I added an eye pin on the top when everything was dry to help me hang it and it was done for now. <laughs> for the little forest, I got lucky and spotted these mini snowy trees in Hobbycraft that I thought could work. They needed a little bit of trimming and shaping, but otherwise it was a hell of a lot easier than trying to make them from scratch. I used half of one of the clear baubles to help me shape a small circle of Sculpey. The idea for this was that this could be the base of my forest and then the bauble would have this slight curve so that it would fit nicely once it was dry. Though I couldn't cook the Sculpey inside the bauble because the plastic would have melted around it so I'm not really sure how necessary this stage was. I guess it helps to know it's going to fit into the bauble at least. I then pushed the base of three different heighted trees I wanted them all to be at slightly different heights so that it would be more interesting to look at and also it would give it a little bit of more perspective when it's on that smaller scale too. And then I took my little piece of Sculpey clay and cooked it at 130 Celsius for about 12 minutes. I didn't go the full 15 just because of how small and thin it was. And once it had cooled off, I painted a thin layer of white acrylic paint over the top. This is probably one of the most arduous parts in a way because you have to keep letting it dry and then flip it over and then paint the other side and dry over and over again. But this layer of acrylic really helps you later on when you need to glue things onto the clay, so it just has to be done. I just kind of question how many layers you have to do compared to what I did. After it dried again, I glued the trees down into place and then painted the gold bases that they had white so that it would all flow together. I wasn't a big fan of this clay texture though when it was finished, so I took some white felting wool that I had. If you don't have felting wool, then pulling apart some cotton wool would be practically the same texture anyway. And I wrapped that around the base using the end of one of my paintbrushes to try and flatten it down and shape it around the trees. I also watered down some PVA glue in some water, kind of like you would for paper mache, and I brushed that lightly onto the wool. You don't want to drench it, you're kind of more looking to flatten down some of the random loose hairs of the wool, so it kind of looks more like snow drifts rather than a big snow blizzard. <laughs> this also helps you to adhere the wool onto the clay itself so it's not going to get loose when you seal it all up in the bauble. I did this by wrapping it around the clay and then painting the bottom with thicker PVA glue. You don't have to worry too much about the bottom being messy because who's going to see it? <laughs> Now once you're happy with the snow and the base that you've made, use a thin bit of white or clear thread and thread the miniature car through the hanger of the bauble. I wrapped the thread a few times around before tying the knot just to make sure it felt secure and I hung mine pretty high in the bauble so it was well above the trees but the level you want your car to fly at is obviously up to your eye and mind and what you think looks best, so long as you avoid the one pink willow I guess. And then you just glue it all together. I used a craft glue again, which is just a slightly stronger type of PVA if you were wondering, and I used some washi tape to hold the two sides together while it dried. And after you've added your twine thread and hang it all up, you're done! <laughs> this is really hard to show working as the car hangs and moves around a lot, but I really like the effect and the little scene that it creates. It just makes me think of Christmas at Hogwarts, so I do love seeing it tucked away on the tree. These two were some of the more complicated DIYs in this collection, but even so, I really wanted to include them because I think all of the effort behind them is really worth it. I had some tiny plant pots laying about from some succulents that had outgrown them, and I'd been holding on to them for a while with this project in mind. I wanted to create some magical plants, the Mimbalus Mimbletonia and the Mandrake in particular. So the first thing to do was create some plant skeletons, and I did that by crushing down some tin foil into the rough shapes of the plants that I was going to make. With the mandrake having its roots and arms and legs, I did wrap some wire around the foil and then add a bit more foil to secure it onto that body that I'd made, just to act as a guide for the clay later on. I rolled a really thin layer of Sculpey and I wrapped that around both of the foil skeletons that I'd made, kind of like a base of clay that we could continue to work from and onto. Once all the foil was covered in clay, for the Mimbletonia, I rolled these little balls of clay and pressed them onto the sculpture. I then used some clay crafting tools to press the clay smooth and secure onto the body of the plant. The tools that I did use to make this during this part did make the whole thing a lot easier, so I would definitely pick up a cheap set like mine from eBay. They're around a fiver and they're going to last you a lifetime, but if you can't get hold of them however, 
using paintbrush handles, pencils, even blunt dinner knives and forks will all let you smooth and texture clay, so don't let the tools hold you back. I pushed little holes into my clay as the Mubletonia has this kind of pustule-like appearance and ended up giving it a bit of texture while making it a bit easier to paint later on too. If you don't have this type of tool, again, the end of a pencil would give you pretty much the same effect. Finally, I pushed some short cuttings of wire into the surface of the clay at the end to make these little nettles that protrude out of the Mimbletonia. The mandrakes were a bit more fiddly, so maybe start with the Mimbletonia if you want to build up some practice with clay beforehand. <laughs> to make the roots, you first want to take some more thin layers of clay like before and wrap those around the wire. Take some care to press that clay into the body as well so that it won't slip off the wire and that it'll stay attached. This may take you a few goes, but stick to it and it's definitely going to work. You can get liquid Sculpey to help at this part. Basically, that allows you to bake it, say at this stage, and then add some more clay details later, which does mean then you don't mess up the shape that you've done at the beginning. But I don't have any of that, so we're gonna try and do it perfectly first time round, the sculpt. There is a wonderful creator here on YouTube called The Craft Maiden who did a great mandrake DIY, which I personally learned a lot from for this project, and I'll make sure to link her video too so that you can see more info on different ways of making this, and also how I sculpted this, and just hear a master talking because she is really good. But the gist of what I did was I took some small balls of clay, pressed them onto the body, and then shaped them to look like the mandrake's features. I wanted mine to be a little bit more playful and happy in appearance. It's kind of happy screaming my mandrake, you know, with it being Christmas and all. So I tried to make its expression a little bit less terrifying and a bit cheerier. Just keep pressing your clay with lots of different tools to round off the shapes, give them a bit of character. I began with the nose and then just worked outwards from there, so I wouldn't crush any of the features that I'd already done and was happy with. Once you spend hours of your day moulding some clay, <laughs> use a sponge to lightly texture the surface. This is going to help you hide some of the fingerprints that you may have done, but it's also going to make it look a lot less shiny and smooth when you paint it at the end. I added the roots at the end of this, which to be honest may have been a bit smart to do at the beginning, so please learn from my mistake. <laughs> I didn't have any twine, so I cut some short lengths of string and attached them to the ends of the wires by using just a bit more soft clay and pressing them onto the roots that we moulded earlier. Once they felt secure, I loosened the strands of the string so that they would fan out and be easier to paint later on. I baked both of these sculpts whilst they sat inside their future plant pot homes in the oven at about 1.30 for about 15 to 20 minutes, depending on which one. I won't lie to you, the Mimbletonia lost a few of its pustules falling over in my oven, but overall it was okay. But you may want to give yours a bit of a flatter or bigger base than I did. Once they've cooled down, I brushed a thin layer of white acrylic paint onto them. You want to do this and make sure it's thin so that it doesn't leave this streaky brush texture on your sculpts. We're doing this because paint holds on better to other paint than it does to Sculpey, so we're going to give them a base to all layer up from. And with it being white, it means that your colours aren't going to be murky or discoloured by the original colour of the clay. Once that's dry, I began with a darker brown paint and painted into all the crooks and crannies of my mandrake. It's best to always do two thin layers rather than one thick layer of paint when painting on your sculptures so you don't get these visible brush strokes or lines. Yes, it will take forever, but you'll have your pet mandrake forever so it's going to be worth it. <laughs> I also painted the string with this brown paint, and doing this I painted all my fingers brown too. It's a pretty messy part of the job to give them good coverage, but it's not like paint doesn't wash off, so... And then you can dry brush on some lighter colours over the top. I did this brownish green, some more yellow and golden brown tones, and by adding no water to your acrylic paint when you do this, you can just swipe it across the sculpt. And by not pressing into those creases, this is going to make those raised up areas pop out more, and they'll be brighter coloured and look more 3D as they'll catch that paint, and it just makes it look more alive, it's definitely worth doing. I did the same with the Mimbletonia, I started with some thin layers of green paint as the base, and then just continued to add details by first dry brushing over the surface with different colours, and then also adding some tinier painted on details too for the purple pustules, and on the wires just to make them stand out. Once you're happy with the paint jobs that you've done, you can get to sealing your paint. A glossy sealant like mine or some PVA will protect your paint, just try to make sure it's as thin as your paint layers were, so it doesn't look crazy shiny at the end, unless you want a really shiny plant. 
With the mandrake especially, I didn't want to overgloss it as I didn't think it would look natural. I wanted one of those real looking mandrakes. <laughs> so when I came to the roots, I wanted that stringy, dry looking texture to remain, but I also wanted to shape them. So what I did was I dipped my fingers in PVA and then shaped the string between my fingers into some random root-like shapes. This helped to stop the strands coming back together and forming like one block of string and just gave them that more rootish look. There's no perfection to this part too. Honestly, it looks better the messier you're getting, so just have fun with it. For the leaves sprouting from the mandrake, I actually picked up this little set of craft leaves from Hobbycraft. They were in a florist section full of fake plants. What's great about these is that they used florist wire for the stems, so I could twirl a couple leaves together and just stick them into the holes that I'd made earlier when moulding with some glue. And then later, when dry, I could just move them into whatever position that I liked. If you can't find something like these, then you could use thin or florist wire and cut some fell or fabric leaves out and just stick them to the ends of the wires to achieve something pretty much the same. Now my little plant pots were very clearly plastic and not ceramic, so I dry brushed some paint onto them to give them a bit more gradient and detail. You don't have to go too crazy, just a few brush strokes are going to make them look a hell of a lot better. And then we're on the final stretch. Attach some coloured thread as a hanger to the inside of your plant pots, and then glue your Mimbletonia and Mandrake into place. And there you have it. Honestly, these are pretty big, so you can just tuck them between the branches of your tree, and they're gonna be fine, but if you have a cat like me, looping the hanger behind them on a branch just gives you a bit of peace of mind in case your cat wants to suddenly go on some tree climbing adventure. For the Fantastic Beast inspired bauble, I knew I wanted to create a little Niffler because they're the most fantastic beast. <laughs> like with the Mandrake and the Mimbleless Mimbletonia, I crushed some tin foil into a little bean shape. I guessed the size by comparing it to the clear bauble it was going to fit into as I was shaping it, and then I warmed up some Sculpey in my hand and just made a thin sheet of it to wrap around the tin foil, kind of like a thin skin layer. I then shaped some more Sculpey into the platypus head-like piece and a little curved tail and attached them both using some clay tools to smooth them out onto the body piece. If you don't have any craft tools, using paintbrushes and smooth pencils, they're all going to work pretty similarly. The Super Sculpey I'm using is very soft, so it wasn't too hard to attach them like this. I've used regular Sculpey in the past, but it's nowhere near as malleable as this stuff and this is kind of a similar price too, so I would definitely recommend using it instead. But if you've only got Sculpey to hand, you can always add a tiny bit of olive oil to your clay once you've warmed it up a little, and that'll help you soften it up a bit more. Just be careful not to add too much or it's going to be slipping out of your hand like soap. Once you're happy with the shape and it's looking a bit more Niffler-like to you, use a clay knife just to scratch the clay surface gently, and then it'll give it a bit of a rough fur-like texture. This will help you a lot when painting later too, but be careful to not hold your sculpt too tightly in your hand at this stage, or you can end up ruining the shape you made originally. Maybe let the clay cool off for a half an hour or so before you do this if you're worried that you may crush it. Once that part's done, I gave him some little round bits of clay for his eyes, I pressed them onto them and then baked it for about 15 minutes at 1.30 in the oven. I painted a thin layer of white acrylic paint, as was the style at the time. <laughs> really, you could skip this stage and go straight to a dark blue or black paint layer if you'd rather, but it was kind of force of habit at this point, and I can't help but start with lighter colours when painting first, so here we are. The main thing you want to do is make sure that you've had this very thin layer of acrylic paint that you haven't watered down too much and get it all into the different grooves of your sculpture. Once you've got your darkest tone in the grooves, you can pick a lighter colour for the fur and dry brush it onto your niffler. By not pressing too hard or using any water on your brush, you'll just catch the sticky out parts of the clay and it's going to make it look a lot more textured and fur-like. I stuck with the classic black niffler, but you could always do it with a different coat or maybe make more of them if you prefer. It'd just be the exact same technique with any coat really. Start with your dark colours in the grooves as your base, and then brush lighter colours over the top. I gave him some peach eye sockets, nose and tootsies, and then I painted on some cheeky eyes and he was done. Again, I glossed the niffler to protect the paint, a sealant or PVA will all just work just fine. Now I'm not sure if this is going to be one of those things that doesn't actually exist outside the UK, kind of like Christmas crackers, but I picked up some gold coins to use as my galleons. If these aren't a thing and you have no idea what I'm talking about right now, gold foil or gold paper could work just as well. 
And if you think I'm crazy for questioning gold coins' existence, thank you for sticking with me right now. First thing I did was find something to replace the chocolate inside of these because I wanted to seal this up forever. Sounds a bit ominous when I say it like that, but I found this foam board that was almost exactly the right depth. So I traced around the coins when they were still filled with chocolate and used those as a guide to cut out some new fillings. This did mean I had to remove the chocolate coins from their foil to add the foam board, but it was a task I grudgingly took part in. And once I had eaten all of those chocolate coins and had a load of foil, I cleaned them all out with a bit of soap and water and once they were dry, proceeded to stick them onto the foam disc that I made earlier. They weren't as perfect as they were when they were filled with chocolate. How could they be? <laughs> and I think that could be a very fun variant of this DIY. If you're maybe wanting to give this as a gift, you could always fill a clear bauble with the chocolate coins, uneaten of course, and add your little niffler to the bauble so that they could crack it open and maybe find a hidden niffler inside. I just made this though as a decoration for our tree, but that could be a fun change up if that appeals to you more. Because mine is going to live in its bauble for the rest of its life, I ended up gluing some of the coins around my Niffler figurine. By doing this, you can make sure that it's not going to get lost falling to the bottom of the bauble when it's sealed, and that way it can just float on top of all the other loose coins. Once it was dried, I just took the Niffler and its coins into the bauble and just glued around the edges and secured it with a bit of washi tape while it dried. And then you have a little content niffler in its bauble. I really like this one because the coins really reflect light well. So when it's on the tree, it really glitters nicely. It's an eye-catching decoration too, as you can see, though Rory still seems to find the mouse to be the tastiest decoration. This last project has a lot of little parts to it, but I was really happy with how it looked when they all came together. So much of this can be personalized to fit you, which I think makes it a wonderful addition to your Christmas tree. Now, I did get this idea after seeing Karen Kavet's Christmas DIY video, which I'll make sure to link, as she made loads of amazing projects for Christmas. When I saw her suitcase, I knew I wanted to make one, but being in the UK, there were quite a few things that I couldn't find equivalents of here, because the US seems to have far more cool crafting things to be getting on with. And in other cases, I knew I was going to do them differently, so I decided to include the process behind this here so that I could maybe give you more ideas on how to tackle this DIY yourself, with what you have available. The plan was to create two trunks, one for my partner who's a Gryffindor and one for me and I'm a Slytherin, and decorate them both with our house scarves and what pets we take. To make the trunks I wanted them to have a bit of weight and strength behind them, so I cut some rectangles of foam board and glued them all together to basically make a large block of foam board that was going to be roughly the size I wanted the trunk to be. And once that was all dry and stuck together I could begin carving them down into shape. The suitcases kind of have beveled edges when you look at them, so I wanted to use a craft knife to cut off the corners of the blocks. Basically, any time there was a 90 degree angle, I cut that down to soften the edge. So long as you're always pointing the knife down towards your cutting board or away from you, you're going to be fine doing all of these over little cuts. Yes, they aren't all going to be perfect and symmetrical, but I kind of like to imagine they're a bit worn for wear, these suitcases, after going years on the train. <laughs> There's always a way to rationalise the imperfections. Now, for the bands that stick out on the suitcase, and that's what I'm going to call them because I have no idea what they're called, I cut some thin sticks of foam board that Rory quality checked for me, and I wrapped these around the suitcases and glued them into place. For the handles, I took one of those thin strips and folded it in half. I cut the end into a point and then glued it together onto one side of the suitcase. I left the other side blank so that I could add our initials later. Once everything had dried and the bands had finally stayed attached to the suitcase because I've been holding them for about half an hour in place, you can begin paper macheing it. Just rip off some pieces of tissue or tissue paper if you have it and paint them onto your suitcase with some watered down PVA. I did this so that it'd be a lot easier to paint on later, plus it holds the bands onto the suitcase in place whilst giving it this kind of wrinkly like leather texture over the top. This did take a fair few hours to dry for me, but in the meantime, you can be thinking about how you want to decorate it. For my partner's suitcase, I wanted to make a little owl in an owl cage, because we've had a few run-ins with little owls over the years. <laughs> that makes it sound like we've had trouble with them. I guess I could go into details, but the video is probably too long already, and I'd rather leave it up to your imagination anyway. <laughs> so yeah, I wanted to make this cage, and I roughed out how big I wanted the base to be by comparing it to the suitcase, and then just cutting a template out of paper. 
That then helped me to cut out a circular piece of foam board to use as the base. I beveled the edges of the base in the same way that I did the suitcases, just kind of cutting it an angle away from myself. And then I cut some lengths of this brass wire that I had and bent it into this rough semicircle-like shape. I just needed some rough lengths of wire that we could work with later when the owl sculpture was done. Now for the little owl sculpt, I used a reference image and a little sketch I did beforehand as a guide on how I wanted this little guy to look. The key thing to sculpting something this tiny is to not make it from too many little bits of clay, as those can crack and fall off a lot easier. You really want to mould one lump of clay as much as possible. So instead of making, say, a ball of clay for the body and another ball for the head, I used the side of a knife to make a rough edge around the top of the owl's body. By slowly working around this, you can make it look like it's a separate piece of clay sitting on top, but then its head is not going to detach. You know, he can only be nearly headless, some might say. Okay, I'm going to stop. So for the eyes and the wings, I did use some small bits of clay, but I pushed them into the surface and smoothed them out as much as I could as possible, just to keep them attached. Then I added some feather-like texture just by roughing up the surface a little with a knife. I created the legs by curving some strips of wire around a little log of clay I made, and pushed those into the bottom of the owl sculpt so that he had some legs to stand on. For my pair, I wanted to bring Rory, my ginger tom, because he was bigger than the owl, I was a bit more comfortable using more pieces of clay separate from the body piece, but I did still try to minimise it as much as possible. Again, I used the tools to shape the clay and texture it until I had this rough, rory looking cat. <laughs> this might be a weird reference like the coins are earlier, but this little rory that I made really reminded me of this toy that I used to collect as a kid. They were called Kitty in Your Pockets and Puppy in Your Pockets, and they used to sell them on magazines in the 90s. I used to love those toys so much, and to be honest, it really made me think, if you feel worried or maybe not as confident sculpting your pet for this DIY, maybe you could repurpose a little figure or a little toy as your pet. You could always repaint it too if you wanted to. Anyway, it's just another option. But if you've crafted one, just cook them again for 15 minutes at 1.30 in your oven, and then just give them one of those painted white acrylic paint bases that we're doing in every single craft it seems today. And then it's kind of rinse and repeat of what we've learned from the Mandrake, the Moonbiltonia and the Niffler. Begin with your base colour in a slightly darker tone of paint, and then keep adding layers of paint over it in lighter tones. For the tabby coat markings and the owl's feathers, I just used a very small brush to add brush strokes as details, and then I glossed over them both to seal the paint. The suitcases are a lot of fun to paint, and it's really up to you how you're wanting this all to look. I went with a burgundy red for my partner's suitcase and a dark emerald green for mine, with the bands being gold and silver respectfully. I really like the idea of matching the house colours, but really, you could go any colour that you like. It's a great chance to let your creativity flow at this point and just make it really unique and individual to you. I painted the base first before adding the painted bands in a different colour. For those bands, I used a flat acrylic paint that was like a gold colour, and then I added a second layer on top of it using a metallic gold paint over the top. The metallic acrylic paints that you can pick up from the shop are usually quite transparent, so they look best when they're layered over a similar flat colour to themselves rather than just being used on their own. If your edges are looking a little bit messy, don't worry about it because the next stage is going to help you cover up anything like that. Just blend a slightly darker coloured paint than your base and then line the edges of the bands. This is going to make them pop out and look more 3D too, and it's going to give your suitcase a little bit more texture. Dry brushing onto your suitcase like we did with the sculpts is also a really nice way to bring out some of that paper mache texture you did earlier if you're wanting your suitcase to look a little bit more rough and weathered too. Finally, add your initials to the flat side of the suitcase. I used one of my fitness brushes to do this, but a marker, especially a metallic marker, would be a great alternative. I just didn't have one, so I had to paint it. Now to finish off the owl cage. You want to paint that piece of foam board that we made earlier with some of that gold metallic looking paint, and then add a circle of felt to the top to make it look like a kind of cushion. I added one to the bottom of mine as well so that it would stick a bit easier onto my suitcase later on. Glue your owl into place on the cushion of felt, and then take those bent bits of wire from earlier and push them into the foam, gluing them into place all around your little owl. Now it's time to assemble your suitcase. I made some little house scarves that you're going to see now. I haven't added that stage in the video on how to make them because I just used a friendship bracelet tutorial here on YouTube and stopped when it was long enough for this craft. I'll link to that video so that you can use it as she explains it a lot better than I could. Then you just choose how you want to arrange your suitcase and use some super glue to hold all of these little pieces into place. 
These are big enough to sit on a tree branch too, but to make sure they don't fall off, I glued some little pegs to the bottom of them so they could hold onto the branches a bit. This is really optional and depends on how naughty your pets are. And then I did the same for my cat. I added a little green blanket for Roy to sleep on because this soft texture just kind of adds a bit more detail and interest to the decoration. Plus it fixes onto the glossy suitcase a lot better than two glossy objects are going to stick together. And then they're done and you're ready for Hogwarts. I really hope you enjoyed all today's Christmas DIYs. If you're thinking of giving them a go, make sure to tell me down in the comments. I'd really love to see them too. So if you'd like to link to a picture or message me, all of my social medias are down in the description along with all the materials you need for these DIYs. Also, if you have any questions or you discovered an alternative when crafting, I know I'd love to hear them and they might help someone else when they're crafting, so let's get a discussion going. I love making homemade decorations for the tree because every year when you crack open the decorations, it's like sifting through a little record of all your favourite things and just memories of Christmases that have gone by, so I really hope you've been inspired to make something special for your tree this year. And I hope you all have a wonderful Christmas and a very happy new year. Look after yourselves and I'll see you soon.